Hello and welcome to the Vicarage Study at St John's Church in Poole. A particular welcome if you're new to us and watching online. Our strapline as a parish is knowing and sharing the love of Jesus and uh, I pray that that will be what you find as you spend some time with us. Today I want to give a uh, short Bible reflection and then lead us in prayer and then encourage you to sing the three songs that I've suggested in my email, remembering that your listener is God himself. Today we're continuing our summer series in uh, Matthew's Gospel, looking at possibly the most famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew 14. I say this miracle is possibly the most famous because apart from Jesus' resurrection, it's the only one only miracle recorded in detail by each of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And that was for a reason. Let's read it now. This is Matthew. When Jesus heard what had happened, that's John the Baptist being beheaded, uh, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns When Jesus landed and saw a huge crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away, so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves and loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. I think the first thing to know about this miracle is that it's misnamed. Uh, in the male order, male-oriented society of the day, uh, in the first century, they counted the five thousand men and the women and the children were mentioned as a, as a bit part, really. Um, but uh, I guess if there were 5,000 men, there were probably 5,000 women there as well, and probably several thousand children. We know there was at least one, because he was the one who supplied the bread and fish. Um, uh, so maybe we're talking about the feeding of the 20,000, or at least in the teens, thousands. Certainly, that's more than will fit in AFC Bournemouth's ground, at Dean Court. Just imagine the stadium full and a big overspill crowd in the car park. That's the number of people that Jesus was dealing with. I want to touch today on two things. Uh, the first point is obvious. Uh, it's an amazing miracle and it teaches us a lot about Jesus and we'll think a bit, little bit about some of those things. And the second point is that even though it's Jesus who does the spectacular, the miraculous, there's a role for other people. There's a role for the disciples, there's a role for the crowd, there's a role, as I mentioned, for the supplier of the loaves and fish. By implication, God has a role for us in what he's doing. And I wonder, what's yours? We'll come back to that. First, let's see what the passage teaches us about Jesus. There are several things here. Verse 13, uh, Jesus took time to reflect after a traumatic event, the execution of his cousin, John the Baptist. He took time to step aside and be quiet and go to a place on his own. But still in verse 13, then he, he tries to do that, but a crowd follows him, even when he's trying to get away from them. Uh, he, they follow him because Jesus attracted a crowd. There was something about Jesus that drew people to him. In verse 14, what do we see? Uh, we see that uh, he had compassion 
on the people. And uh, he's just, he described elsewhere in Mark, Mark when Mark's recording this, uh, Mark talks about the fact that how he saw the people as sheep without a shepherd, that phrase that comes up a few times in the Gospels. He had compassion on them and he healed them, Matthew tells us. Jesus is actually he's ready to wind up his disciples a little bit there's a you can see a little bit of a twinkle in his eye when he says some of these things he's stretching his disciples faith you might want to look at verse 16 and then when when he gets hold of the the loaves and the and the fish then what does he do he gives thanks where he took it he gave thanks he broke it and he gave it out to his disciples who gave it out to the people does that ring any bells taking it giving thanks breaking giving out there's something there about the last supper there's clearly something of that in this and then of course there's the biggie uh, Jesus satisfied all those people oh, we read in verse 20 that they go they go away satisfied and then finally uh, I, I suppose, actually, in being satisfied, some of those people probably hark back to what they heard from their ancestors about the manna in the desert. And uh, the implication was clearly that in Jesus, God was at work. Jesus was God's Messiah. And finally, then, even the leftovers are more than Jesus started with. With Jesus, we always get more than we bargained for. As I mentioned, the second thing we see is that there were roles for other people in all this. Yes, it was Jesus who did the spectacular. But there were roles for the disciples. They were having their faith stretched. They saw what was going on. They had a conversation with Jesus. They had those jobs of sharing the bits of bread and fish around the crowd and collecting the leftovers. There were roles for the crowd. The participants, they weren't just observers, they were participants in all this. They have, First of all, they have to be obedient. They were sitting on the grass, we read. They didn't always obey, of course, and crowds don't always obey. Just think about the recent rush to our local beaches. Uh, but uh, actually, that's the disciples in the crowd. There's even a mention for the, the supply, a role for the supplier of the loaves and fish. Uh, we read, not in Matthew, but in, in John, actually. When John records this, he, he describes it as a, as a boy was the one who uh, brought the loaves and fish. All these people were part of what God was doing. And so as you and I reflect on our lives, we realise that somehow we get caught up in the purposes of God. What an amazing privilege that is praying be it for people or situations or volunteering maybe a messy church or the drop-ins or something else um, sharing faith with someone and seeing them become a Christian unpacking the good news of Jesus and helping somebody understand the gospel being alongside someone at a tough time inviting someone to Christian Christianity Explored. There are loads of examples of how we can get caught up in God's purposes. We'd be here all night if I listed all of them. As I end, I want to ask you, what's your part in God's big plan for the world? Maybe you think, I could never have a plan, and never have a part in something quite so big. If so, may I respectfully say, you're wrong. Uh, one of the thrilling things about being a Christian is having a part to play in God's purposes. So please take time to think about the part that God is calling you to play. And then step up and play it with his strength. The same Jesus who fed all those thousands of people all those years ago is calling you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that with Jesus we always get more than we anticipate. 
Thank you, that was true when he fed those thousands. And it's true today too. Thank you for the way you fed us over the years. Physically nourishing us with the things we need to grow. And spiritually nourishing us with the things we need to grow. Thank you Lord that even though Jesus is in the starring role. He calls us to play bit parts alongside him. And in his name. As we thank you, Lord, we take a moment to lift before you those things on our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we're sorry for the times when we have either misunderstood you or neglected the roles you call us to. There are Many times when we've let you down by what we, either what we have done or what we haven't. As we say sorry Lord to you, uh, we lift before you those things on our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, please prompt us and enable us to step up into the roles to which you call us. Help us to perceive your big plan for the world. Help us to get caught up in your purposes. Help us be open to learning from others, bearing in mind that you're at work in them too. We have lots of things to ask you, Lord, and we do that now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we'll finish with the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught those who follow him. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. As I sometimes say, it's all about him. The Lord's Prayer just teaches us, really. Uh, it's about his name, his kingdom, his will, his power, and his glory. He's at work. And he calls us to work alongside him. In Jesus name. See you next time.